It's just that's just random things that people do. Right. But the conspiracy theorist sees them as aliens. You know, must be got to be aliens. Of course, it, it's got to be Bigfoot. <laughs> I saw a Bigfoot documentary the other day where the guy says, I don't have to prove there is a Bigfoot. They have to prove there isn't one. And I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that how science works? I think so. I think, yeah. It kind of is now. Let's say hunker down. Hunker down. Hunker, hunker down. down, y'all. Hunker down. Hunker down. Hunker down. Hunker down. Hunker down. Hunker down. H- hunker down. Hunker down. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is... Uh Hey, it's us again. We're we're back after like a month of being down for various reasons, but now we're back to... We're back from our rumspringer. We've decided we don't want to fuck with the real world. Yeah, we'd prefer to stay hunkered down. We're going to come back to the colony? Is that what an Amish gathering is? Uh, we're coming back, though, with tattoos and everything like that. Yeah, we're way back at like 100% of whatever the capacity that we usually operate at is. Well, the good news is that the fridge appears to have enough beer to send power to all three of us, so... What kind of beer? Uh, uh, Urban South. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, fine locals, supportive of Allie local Allie is cultures. enjoying a uh, fine Urban South Charming Wit. Uh, Varg looks like he's about to crack open one in a minute. Mm-hmm. And, Cracking up uh, a cold one. It's a beautiful... With the boys. It's a beautiful can. It is. It's a seersucker can. Yeah, it's a... Um, it seems like an artist created it. It's nice. Line yeah. drawings. Line pen and ink drawings. It is drawings. bougie as fuck, though. Seersucker is. But it's a fine beer. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got one. I've got it also the, uh, says on the can, Here's to the storytellers. A crisp, smooth drinking Belgian white, Belgian style vit beer. Perfect for telling tales, laughing loud, and rambling into the night. <laughs> Well, I say, then, uh, that was the most scared that girl ever was. <laughs> Wouldn't you say, Jethro? Are you okay? I'm not even going to try and do that accent. I would feel miserably. Ooh. After being up north for a couple of weeks, my accent is stronger than ever, and just very happy about that. You know, you really have been on a trip. You've been, uh... <sighs> Lord, oh. I was born a rambling lady, as the <laughs> Almond Brothers once sang. R.I.P. Greg. Word, yeah. I um I did the smart thing and I got out of the heat for a couple weeks and I recommend that everyone who uh, everyone should be able to do that. In when I, you know, when we have our our socialist economy of the future, and from from each according to their ability and to each according to their need, uh, my needs include not living here in the summer. So a simple need, yeah, very simple need. When you're not chained to the machine that holds you in to the right. summer in New Orleans, you're free to go out and express... Yeah. yeah, I'll let somebody else hang on to the means of production for a minute while I get the fuck out of here. Well, good. you could just find means of production where you go. That's true. Yeah. And then you were away in Houston, which is just as hot as I here. went to Planet Houston, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it was pretty hot. Did you um, go to the Mexican bakery? I did not. I did not. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever make it there. I'm always going to Houston for a reason. And then when the reason's done, it's my uh, duty to get the fuck out of there. Also, um, it, has, it has good things. Well, one of the good things is the liquor. One of the things that aren't good is the liquor laws, and uh, I found that out. You know how I am about leaving New Orleans, and I, how I don't know the rules everywhere else. Um, yeah, I didn't I know ran, the rules. I ran into that problem too. I, I pulled. I mean, I had been on the road for a while, and. It was not how I wanted to spend a Friday night was to be on the road, you know. So going to Houston, and I was, and we got into Houston. We got the, we hit that Daytown Bucky's, and I walked up and I got me some Lone Star, and they had the Tall Boys, which they rarely do, and it was cold, so cold. <laughs> mm, I can feel it on my fingers now. Place it on the counter. There's this little I don't know, 18 year old girl there. And I've got some Beaver Nuggets with me and two 12, six packs of. Lone Star. Okay. And she goes, you can get the nuggets, but I'm going to have to take the beer. We don't serve them after midnight. 
we don't serve beer after midnight. What? And I, I got, I was suddenly I became Ron Swanson, and I was like, Bucky's doesn't serve beer after midnight. And I kind of nodded my head like, yes, <laughs> like yes, like in a sort of like, I'm going to convince you that this is true type thing. She goes, no. I was like, the county doesn't serve beer after midnight. She's like, no. I was like, the state doesn't serve beer after midnight. She goes, nope, it's a statewide law, sir. I can take the beaver nuggets, but you'll have to leave the beer. And I was just like, because <sighs> suddenly Charlton Heston fucking was coming out at me. You know? Yeah, I was like, you fucking government banks. Guess your IRA. So far, it yeah. sounds like she's she's pretty well trained up on how to handle this. Thing. Yeah, she. I mean, when I like go into Bucky's in Houston, looking like I do, I'm a fucking everybody's looking at me, you know? It's like, I'm the only person whose shorts aren't don't have pleats on them. Yeah, they're gonna fucking look at me. And I got mutton chops out to fucking... Yeah. Your summer chops. Yeah. So I just go, Draconian! And I stormed out. <laughs> Is that what you said? Did yeah. you buy the beaver nuggets, though? Nope. Well, no, I did. I did. <laughs> I did. And I also got some, like, beaver Cheetos, and they were stale. That pissed me off. Urgh, and then Jeremy in. comes out cracking up because he, as he's walking up to the counter, he sees like a dude walking back with the same beer he saw me walk by with, and he he knew I didn't get it. And then I was just like, and then and I was like, well, how? When do they stop serving beer in bars? And she goes two o'clock, and I look, and it's like fucking twelve forty-five, and we're at that Baytown Bucky's. So we're not in Houston yet, and everything is miles from everything else. Yeah, and I'm like, holy shit, I. This might be a serious fucking problem here. Like, I might not get booze tonight. Oh, my God. On a, on a night when I'm not planning not to have booze. Right. Heaven forfend. <laughs> Generally, I'm thinking if I, if I go a night without booze, I wake up that morning and say, I'm not drinking tonight. And then I'm just in that mode all day. But if I spend five hours in a van of the opinion that I'm going to fucking have me some beers. At the end of every road trip, I want booze. What the fuck? Yeah. So, did it work out for you? We rushed. Night? Okay. <laughs> like, I was, like, on Jeremy's house. I was like, hurry the fuck up, bro. Come on, let's go. We found a bar that was a, you know, hugely douched in bar. <laughs> and Ding. I got me a little Doushed fucking it. shift drink, you know. Knocked that out. Had a couple more beers. Felt great. Okay. So, is it, I'm glad that it worked out. I'm no, it didn't work out. Those fucking laws suck. It, it, fucking, it, it pisses me off. That's why I won't live anywhere yeah. else but New Orleans or Las Vegas. So but I don't want to live in Vegas. So come on, New Orleans, get it together. So that's where I was getting to. Like, both of you went to have your little... You had your spiritual renewal in uh, Michigan and in Chicago. And then you had your dark experience in Spiritual Houston. renewal that, I, that I'm basically becoming Ignatius. And both of you came home to this really... We both missed the floods. Yeah. Oh, you both were out of town. Uh, yeah, when I was okay. in Houston, yeah, I guess y'all it, were in your kayaks drinking your beer. Screaming at people not to drive fast. All the little flood cliches happened, except for the water was a little higher. Yeah. I mean, Allie and I were talking about this earlier, and I was kind of telling her that, like, you know, this was like, you guys got to come back to the, I guess, the aftermath where we had the angry council meeting and the, like, the successive revelations of things that were, you know, not as they should be. Everybody thinking (laughs) that they're... Experts on everything. Yeah, everybody and finding out that they were wrong. Everybody drain explaining everything to one another, right? So it was a war of, a retri- of attrition for how smart everybody was. <laughs> this, did you how how dumb did you not look? Right. So there's that. But then, uh, what was really fun for me is that like, I just felt like I was home, and I guess I hadn't even gone anywhere, and you guys had been out of town, out of state. But like, just back into that atmosphere, I haven't really felt that way in a while. And like, even though I feel terrible about people who lost their cars and you know they had water in their homes Basically and their businesses, in the but there was an aspect of this that was just like, yeah, you know, here we are, we're back to doing the things that we do Fuck best. It, Jeff, who, so, who thinks that way, dude? Jeff does. <laughs> He's like, oh, everything's normal. It's, it's yeah. shitty and property's <laughs> being ruined. Nah, home. Yeah, the old New Orleans won. Get the fuck out, newbies. <laughs> and that's the other thing, you know. Nice. Uh, th- that's the other thing now that is popping up. Like, uh, you know, people are now telling everyone that they have their uh, whatever it is, Katrina their, their badge or whatever it is that you, you know, like. You if you just got here in the last couple of years, now you have your flood badge. Oh, this is so fucking. <clears throat> 
So that's great. So uh, do we want to talk a little bit about what happened? Well, you should this tell week? me what happened because I've done. I've been so out of pocket. I didn't know that the even that football was about to even happen. <clears throat> nor have I been following any of the flood shit other than what I just see go by on Facebook and then see like the first three comments of and then I drift off. And Facebook has a lot of bad information. Yeah, which is where I got all of my information. So So you you have a hundred percent of the eight of the information that was available to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And and I'll I'll tell you what I think happened and you can tell me how fucking wrong or not I was. Just oh that by, that'll be a fun what I was from when I was in Houston and coming back and just reading shit on Twitter, not even reading an entire news story from a legitimate news source whatsoever, okay. just Twitter, Facebook, and what people came in the gallery. So, okay. So, first of all, according to Cousin Pat, it rained nine inches, two inches, wait, a certain amount of inches in a certain amount of hours, and that's why the city flooded. This is Pat's first statement. Yeah. Awesome. That got repeated over and over again by several other people. Yes. And that's why the fucking city flood flooded. Okay. Then... So far, you're correct. People said the pumps weren't on. Some of the pumps weren't working, and then it ended up being most of the pumps weren't working. That's... N- it was never most of the pumps weren't statement. working. It's most of the pumps in the areas that are that were flooded. The pumps in the that, areas that were flooded. I think that's still an overstatement. Yeah. Okay, so so here's some here's, of them here's the deal. Also, wait, hang on, hang okay, on. we'll take this one by one once he once he's done with his statements. Okay, right. People's fucking Mardi Gras beads and go cups and shit flooded, not uh, kept the basins. The basins were all full. Not enough people get out there with uh, PVC and clear them out. And the people that do are really fucking smart. Uh, that's true, although it is also mostly, like, yard waste that clogs the drains. Leaves and shit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And mud and stuff. Um, other than that... Also, we need to have a smarter relationship with water, where I think it's we redirect it instead of trying to pump it out. Yes! Yay! Um, Pick all that up. I think you're operating at about 88% uh, capacity <laughs> nice. here. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you Just got it gathering all. gathering but... stuff on Facebook. Just from my Facebook and Twitter followers. <clears throat> right, so See, you, and you've social gotten, media works. And you've gotten the main points, which are that the two main points to take away are that uh, the system wasn't working at full capacity, uh, but that we would have flooded anyway, even if it had been. And as a result, Mitch... Who was skiing at, or who was in a ski city at the time? He was possibly nice. at a Illuminati convention. <laughs> um, came back and cleared house at the Sewage and Water Board in a attempt to privatize that utility here in New Orleans. Okay, so let's take these one one by one. Then. Okay. So the first point you made was that people were. Uh, immediately explaining to one another about the amount of rainfall and that the rainfall. I think everybody became a flood control. Expert. Everybody yeah. became an expert in the fact that it's the the pumps have the capacity to drain like an inch of rain, an inch in the first hour, and a half an hour or half an inch each hour after that. Right. So that's and then we got like nine inches, or at least parts of the city got like nine inches in Two three and or four hours. hours. Right. Two and a half hours. I believe. Yeah. Okay, so 9. obviously... 3, 9.43 inches. Jeff, was, did you look out the window and say, whoa, that's a lot of fucking rain? Well, see, uptown where we are now, where we're in the protected part of the world in God's country, you know? The sliver it's safe where, here. Where, it is. Where, it's, where nothing ever happens. Um, y'all, because y'all deserve it. Yeah, because we're better than, than the yeah. rest of you guys. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it was, it was rainy. Nothing. So like a cell moved over... St. Claude and the Seventh Ward and it was a, it was a it was a summer rainy day. It was a very like, but it was a very localized thunderstorm. Okay, yeah, mm-hmm. and in fact, uh, several of the you know papers, like several of the papers, several of the websites that produce news produced maps that showed exactly where the uh, where the rainfall was, and it was heaviest in Mid City. It was heaviest kind of towards Lakeview, but it, the nine inches was in Mid City, I think. Yeah. Point about that is that. There was a lot of rain, and there would have been a flood, right? Yeah, from what I my understanding of this, and and I'm not going to call myself an expert, but 
I do know a lot about this. And from what talking to people, uh, my initial thought was, you know, I bet that if the pumps had been operating at a at a more full capacity, I don't think it would have been any worse or any less depth, uh, you know, flood depth. I don't think that like the water would have been lower, uh, but I think it would have drained faster. And in talking to some engineers, that's exactly what they said. They said that it would have been the same places would have flooded. It would have been the same depth, but it would have just drained out faster the way it usually does. Okay. And that was part of the problem is that it took until like well into the middle of the night for some of the these areas to drain. So it was a it, like that process was very delayed more so, than usual. So that's let's go into the next point now because I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about this because you know this better than I do. But I, I did get a kick out of the fact that. First of all, we moved from this phase where everybody was saying, shut up, it's, you know, don't ask. It was just a lot of random. Don't ask too many questions about it, you know, shut up. And instead of doing that, we got out with the pitchforks and the torches and went to city council and brought everybody up, you know, for the show trial. Which is really fine. Which, (laughs) which. it's fine. We'll we'll get into why that was good and bad. Let them know. But it. It was good in that it did bring to light a lot of really interesting facts. And the first one is that the the system was not operating at full capacity, um, despite the the hemming and the hawing about what that even means. And that's a reasonable thing to do because I don't think that the system can operate at, like, I don't think you can turn on every single pump all at the same time at 100%, even if you wanted to. So there's a certain amount of capacity at each station that's redundant. Okay. I don't know what that percentage is, right. but there is redundant capacity within the system. Right. But what we were told eventually is that because of electrical failures, mostly, there's... Susan Waterboard has uh, this electrical plant where they produce their own power. So they had to build that because when they the Susan Waterboard built all these pump stations in the first place... First of all, they were in the swamp. They were in the mm-hmm. back swamp. They were in the middle of nowhere. And also, it was before we had like national electricity standards. So they built them on 25-cycle power, uh, which is a really efficient for those types of pumps. Um, but then later on, as a country, we decided that we're going to do everything on 60-cycle power. But which, it means that they have to power all of their own shit. They can't get their power from Entergy. Right. Except that they can because they, in some places, have converters. And some of their pumps run on 60-cycle power. So it's a mix between their own power, Entergy's power, and like backup generators and stuff like that. And it uh, makes things catch on fire? Well, the the power plant in Car- at Carrollton is, has five turbines. And um, two of the turbines went out in like February and May. They just like totally stopped producing power, and so they've been under emergency repairs. Um, and then um, there's one that has been out since Katrina. One that's been out since Katrina, there's, there's, and then one caught on fire two nights ago. Right. So they were down to one turbine to produce power for the whole system. One of the things that I learned this week is there's one of these uh, turbines has a plaque of. Uh, issued to them by GE and the American Association of Mechanical Engineers or whatever. But it's it's congratulations on uh, having the uh, the oldest operating steam engine in America. Congratulations. And, and it was issued in 1974. <laughs> that's um, awesome. But that's, it's, it's actually pretty cool. Like People like talk about how weird it is that they run on this antiquated power system. And uh, one of the things that we've learned... This weekend, prior, you know, the more you read about this, is that you know it's not it's not like a lower standard of like power production. It's just that it's not what's in commerce now. It's not what you can like. It's like my Tercel. Like, sh- like would, this should be interesting. I don't think that's the right, but okay, whatever. Hold on, if, let's listen. To, let's hear him I'm out. I'll let you finish. <laughs> so, uh, my Tercel had a busted out window in the in the rear driver's side windows busted out for years and years and years because I couldn't find the right glass to fix that window. And Which I am dubious of. Check the records, episode 16 or something. No, it, I it's, think him not finding... No. no you, can it, easily, okay. you can always find it. That, well, that, thing was, that car was mass produced. It's been, tons of those windows out it's there. Been repaired, There's one on Earhart right now. It's been repaired recently and th- we got that glass from like somewhere in Arizona. And it was really hard for like every mechanic we could call and every uh, like 
it was, it's hard to get parts for this car, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, well, but if you're an uptowner, sure. Currently, currently it's working. Okay. But it was hard. It's going to get smashed out when Mardi Gras comes by Probably. again anyway, so. So these these turbines are the same way in that something breaks, something simple, like oh, a they fucking find. thing. Right. No, they have, so a machine, like they a, have a machine shop. They have a crazy machine shop over there because they have to service... Not just the power plant, but a lot of these old pumps and all the pumping stations, like, they don't make parts for any of those. This they, is very New Orleans. They have to make all their own parts. But there's some, like, really talented people who work over there and who craft this stuff. I mean, it's a big deal. It is a big deal, but it's also time-consuming and it's yeah. troublesome. And, you know, they've And backwards. It. Right. Just st- and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody and they, they they have to do it this way. I think it's cool. It, I think it's like the. It's I'm like, sure it is. It's like things the, can be both. It's like the cars in Cuba. You know, they have also to, stupid, but sure. I think it's cool. Yeah, yeah it's, it is cool. That's not cool. Ain't necessarily smart. So it becomes complicated. Uh, Justin Bieber's cool. You remember? Oh, is that, what? Well, to a lot of people, he is. What are you talking that, about? That don't mean he's smart. The, no, what I'm saying is, just because it's cool doesn't mean fucking it should happen. Those cars in Cuba are fucking. Uh, yeah, they're cool. It, okay. it is a fucking horrible thing that, that those cars are still. So around. let me. I'm trying to put this in in a real world ahead, thing for you. I, I, I'm preferring Ali's references over yours because I'm just not buying that that Tercel is like this <laughs> car in Cuba. It's not okay. But go ahead. All right. So let, let me try his car. Let me, is, let me put some. Let me put something else. And some other numbers on this for you. Maybe this uh, AMC Spirit from '83 or something like that. You or you, Fiero. Uh, you obviously. Well, there's no reason a '57 Bel Air can't still be a great car. I if, mean, if you keep it up. Look at the in, the environmental impact of that fucking. Thing, oh my god. Man. Okay. Well, if you want to do that. Jesus, it's. I'm you know. driving the Tercel till it stops moving. That's. I'm I'm with you on that. Yeah. I'm, I'm. So you remember when we started having this uh, yearly cycle of boil orders happen to us because mm-hmm. you know, and then the they would lose power at the the fucking water treatment the power station. outage. Yeah, it's because so, of this shit. It's this the is, same power plant. It's, it's the same power plant. It's the same <laughs> issue. And I'm starting to self actualize with this. So when this became uh, you know a, a, a story at the time, they asked them. So okay, well tell us how much it would cost for you to go in and just completely redo all of your power generation and bring all the pumps up to speed and all your transfer lines and everything. And they said, oh, it'll be like a billion dollars. No, way, way more than that. Okay, it's more than a billion. Well, I read, I read a billion, but it's probably... Couldn't be. Um, it's, it's, well, there's a lot involved in it. There's like land acquisition and there's all sorts of things happening. Well, and you'd have to rip out all of the transmission, line that, transmission lines that go to all the pumping right. stations... All over the place, and you'd have to replace those, and you'd have to replace a lot of the pumps too, because the pumps aren't built to run on sixty cycle power. So, like, it would be tremendously. I bet you there was a time when it would have been easier to do it. Yeah, when they built it a hundred years ago. I bet you somebody's brother in law probably could have came in there, and that that some fucking company, some of time came in and said, "We can switch this out." I'm telling you right now, it'll be two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And so and so's brother in law had the contract, and and he has and his fucking family ran the machine shop and shit. And they're like, no, 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 we're just gonna stick to old fucking Hubert here, and blah 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 blah. blah. And they're like, it'll be fine, go away. And that was probably eighty years ago when that happened. Sounds like some New Orleans thing. You mean, you know, we're gonna have, we'll just build our own machine shop. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and we'll employ. I'll get my my sister's cousin to run it. Yeah, and then he'll vote for me. And that's New Orleans shit. All I can tell you is I like the way you think, but who knows if that's the story right now. What was I getting at? With so comparatively priced, maintaining the system they have now, you know, it's it's still price effective for them. It's just that they haven't been doing it. It's it's almost like Michael Bagnaris's like nuts and bolts factory that he oh, wants to build. Oh man! No, well, so I mean RTA also has a machine shop for the old streetcars and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like there are talented craftspeople. In this town, a lot of, there used to be more back when Avondale was still open. I they, mean, it's that's like a, we built we built things that went to space. Like this is a thing that we did for a long time. All sorts of stuff. They don't make it like they used to. Oh, so anyway, so when when this happened a couple years ago, there, there was a contract let to fix one of the turbines, uh, the one that affected the uh, the water, the drinking water, and it's been like three or four years, and. It, nothing's happened, or it's not done yet, and so that's part of the problem, right? And this all kind of points back to the Sewage and Water Board's administration 
and Sew- sewerage and waterboard. Where? It points back to Cedric Grant, who, because of the series of like you know bam 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 revelations during the council meeting, like he's resigning or retiring. And he announced that right before the meeting started uh-huh. was when he dropped that statement to the press. But what was amazing was that a lot of people in the room had found out, but members of city council didn't seem to know that it had happened because they were waiting for him to show up and someone was yelling from the audience like, <laughs> He's retired. He retired. <laughs> he re- like, he resigned. He's gone. And Jason really? Williams was like, well... Let it go and get him out of this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> because the whole meeting was building up to that point because everyone was so pissed and like everyone wanted to hear from Cedric. And then Cedric <laughs> did his boilerplate on the drainage system as a whole, which yes, more people need to understand. It's a complicated it's a complicated thing. But but then he basically turned it over to Joe Becker and let him hang. It was difficult to watch. Yeah, so so Joe Becker is the like decades long administrator there. Yeah, I don't he's know the what superintendent. his ty- superintendent, and he is actually like the qualified engineer who yes. runs the, who kind of like knows where things are. Yep. Um, but he's <laughs> the one who got roasted at the city council meeting because mm-hmm. Cedric Grant had already made his exit. Yeah. And Grant is a whole other story. He was the deputy mayor who was kind of in charge of infrastructure. And then uh, when they passed this uh, reorganization of Sewage and Water Board, that A, like, it's a rate increase. So your rate is going up. Like, it's every year, yeah. like, your rate is going up. You're right, you're, you're right. You're, but at the same time that they did this, they said, well, okay, we're going to reorganize it and make it more professional. And the way they're making it more professional is they're taking... Uh, some of the appointments from city council members and giving them to the mayor and to, again, the goddamn... uh, Blue Ribbon Commission of some kind. The university presidents and all these people. My my point about all this is when they reorganized the system, uh, Mitch immediately appointed Cedric Grant, and he has made a whole career out of kind of like being what you were kind of getting at earlier, like the guy who knows how to get the money for... You know, brother-in-law. Yeah, that sort of thing. Stuff. I read online that he had a sixty thousand dollars office renovation. That's another thing I picked up along the way. One of the things he did was he renovated his office for sixty thousand dollars, and they they bought a new couch. And you know, it's uh, one room. Uh, yeah, grand? yeah. Dang. I don't think so. Yeah, I think so. I think it was like a suite of some kind. Oh, it's a suite. There's okay. no. Is it? There's a bathroom. Fine. Is there a kitchen in the suite? You can no. do a kitchen for eight grand. I think there was a conference room. Oh, those can get expensive because they're all about the show. The paper made a big deal out of his uh, his new whiteboard, which is like you know, like it's a big electronic board that costs a lot of money. But anyway, um, like you see in war games and shit like mm-hmm. that, like when the pump stations go start going offline, it's like, and there's a guy with headphones on. Yeah, like said, you like to play a game? <laughs> said. pumping station nine is down. Pumping station nine is down. Dun, 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 dun. Tell me this is one of your simulations, Mr. Jackson. All right. Flush the bombers, get the subs in launch mode. We are at DEFCON 1. DEFCON 1. Right. Is it okay. is, is exactly that sort it's of like thing? Like Princess Leia and, and them on Yavin Four. What he said at the time, watching the flood, was that, uh, well, yeah, we could do this on paper. We could just pass paper around, like, oh, but I need to have all this information in front of me right now. I need to know what's going on. Sounds like a genius. I like and that. The, the irony, of course, is that all, almost all of sewage and waterboard is done on paper. Like all of the pump um, logs are paper. All of their time cards are paper. Like everything is still done on paper. All of that stuff that Matt McBride came out with. That yeah, he Uncle Benjamin, call him Uncle Benjamin, because all of a sudden, after like six seasons, 
Matt McBride comes back. You're like, oh, yeah. Matt McBride, we forgot about you. He was fighting wildlings the whole time. <laughs> we, we remember you from season one, Matt McBride. <laughs> um, How are we doing oh, on time, Jeff? Oh, yeah. we're, we're already, we have uh, we're five over. minutes left to Great. make our goal. Oh, okay. Um, let me, let me read you some Cedric Grant quotes. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. So, Cedric Grant, when he got when he got this job of being put over sewage water board, he, he, he's... God this damn, is it him. sounds like you say sewage and water board, bro. The New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans shit. Um, this is a couple weeks ago. There were, the sewage and water board was doing uh, lead testing, like lead quality testing. And the houses were all like board members' houses. That they went and tested the water it was quality. Employees' at. houses. Employees' houses. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and they asked him. Uh, it, so they went and asked Cedric Grant about this. And so I'm just going to read you the back and forth. So the reporter asks, "Are you concerned that that could be maybe a conflict of interest?" And Grant says, "No, I'm not. I'm concerned that you're questioning my leadership and my integrity. <laughs> and instead of like talking about how I am showing my leadership." Okay, <laughs> so he's at the end of his rope in several of these. Yeah. He's, He's put up with, he's, okay, so let's say that he is an infrastructure master or genius. Let's just say that. Uh, he's not. Okay, well, let's just say, for the, way, he, he believes he is. Ron Howard voice. He wasn't. <laughs> so in, in let's say he is. He has to put up, he has this vision for how things should go, and then he has to put up with all the things. Is he the head of the entire sewer ridge and water board, or is he just a part of it? It, yeah, he, runs, he was so, he so, was he was Joe Becker's boss. So yeah. Joe, every fucked up thing that has happened over the sewer ridge and water board over the last however long he's been there, it all he has to put up with all that fucking shit. Mm-hmm. So he has a fucking some lead testing he has to do. What what is the other option? Go and find somebody, knock on their door, and say, "Do you mind if we test the the lead in your yard?" Or go, "Hey, Janet." Do you mind if we... Hey, we need to test the lead. Can we use your yard? Yeah. I, yeah, you're supposed to design a sampling plan right. that, that randomizes it so that you can actually tell like where it's coming from instead of just... Going to everybody. Did he, did he not Did he not just like maybe do that off the cuff and say, oh, so-and-so lives in the east and so-and-so lives over here? And No, they were showing like leadership. Well, yeah, that, that was, that was <laughs> a dumb was thing for him to say. Uh, it sound, That sounds like a dude that's just at the end of his fucking rope. And it's put, been put but up there's also, so much fucking there's shit. also a conflict of interest there, obviously, because if you're working for the agency doing the testing... Oh, you're going to you, say, I nah, ain't no lead here. Right, or oh, okay. just kind of... Yeah, it looks kind of weird. Right. Or that if makes there sense. is, then you're trying to find it at your employees' homes while leaving everyone else who, you know, isn't an employee. Like, you're trying to... It looks like a cover-up. I mean, they shouldn't be involved at all in yeah. the sample, is basically yes. the point. Yes. Well, uh, the sewerage and water board is completely fucked, and everybody who is uh, reading all this and hearing all this is probably thinking in their heads about the time they had to call them and deal with a simple fucking issue, and it probably, as it always does, across the board, 100% of the time, got completely fucked up and was stupid, and they're like, oh my god, these people are running the fucking drainage systems and all that shit. And they're completely fucked, and the whole fucking thing is stupid. So therefore, something needs to be done about it. So then, what happened? Well, you're just yeah. So you're now, and like, there's nobody in town that thinks, oh no, that place is all right, well oiled machine. So we it's have all a, good. If like you mean, ev- every New Orleanian thinks the sewerage and water board. So politically, we have a situation where fucking, something needs to be done. So we're moving. Well, when into something like that happens, now now, now there's yeah. floods that are happening. Now we're in the neoliberal, just do stuff, disaster capitalism stage. Right, and and that's kind of the next thing that we're worried about now is that you know, the mayor has already said that he wants to hire a consulting firm or an outside firm to take over temporary management. It's Veolia. It. Like, let's not kid. It's Veolia. <laughs> it's Veolia, right? Yeah, and uh, you know Veolia. Is the parent company of Transdev or it runs? I don't know if they are anymore, but that's a different story. Okay, I can't remember. They've there have been a lot of acquisitions and spinoffs. Of it's hard to keep up there. with this shit. When yeah. the fairy shit was going on, they were right. Um, so they were over RTA, but they're not necessarily now. Although they have managed water systems in other cities, and they have done a shit job of. They it. They also currently have contracts for our, some of our sewer stuff. Right yeah, now, right. They've already kind of gotten in a little bit. Yeah, they do the um, some stuff in the 
um, east of the Industrial Canal, I mm-hmm. believe. I've got an article. I'll put it in the show notes about um, just how they fucked up Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. So you might know a little bit about that. that mm-hmm. They were involved in Flint. I mean, they're oh, that's great. A- yeah, so anyway. Not a good thing to have on you. That's the. Uh, well, and just like the fact that privatizing utilities, which was also a business line that Enron tried to get into back in the day, mm-hmm. and it turns out they were actually really bad at it. Like, they couldn't even run them out of profit, so they um, had to sell them at a loss, like, all over the world. Um, it was Troy It was a division called Azurix. Um, yeah, anyway. So, like, if Enron can't even do this business properly, like, it's just. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, what was the name of the company? Oh, Veolia. Oh. Yeah. And that's that's probably what's what the next step is. But there's a lot of things that have to happen between now and, and the whole system being given over to them. One of them but it's being, moving really fast. I mean, this week, it went from on, on Monday being like, huh, maybe we need to have a council meeting about this, to Friday being like, we are selling the sewage and water board. <laughs> right. I, like, that happened really fast. For a fast. billion dollars, and we're going to switch it on over to, what do you call, 60, 60 RPMs? What do you say? What do oh, you say? 60 cycle power? We're going to switch it over to 60 cycle power. Yeah, so how 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 would a private company handle that at any kind of different... I don't know. I'm sure we'd, we'd end at up a fucked. a steep markup. Right. That's probably, how they would handle it. That's probably what's going to happen, right? We'd end up fucked. Up. We're yeah. fucked either way. But that's that's... That's going to be a political issue now because apparently, like, it's something that has to go to a citywide referendum. Do we, we should all we should? Oh man, fuck! I was just like, we should all just move away, and then I was like, man, eh, can't get beer after fucking midnight on at Bucky's. No, you're trapped. You're stuck. Fuck! You gotta you gotta deal with this. You gotta go down with the ship like the rest of us. Just um, stock up on beer, I guess, and then don't leave the house. Yeah. Never get out of the boat. There was an article in the. Uh, in, on NOLA.com this afternoon about some of the um, some of the living with water concepts. Mm-hmm. A lot of this is already funded, and some of it. Some some of it. Do you do you want to talk about like the the? Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's the good news is that we have a lot of projects that have been in the design stage for quite some time, and are about to go into construction in the next. Uh, year or two or three um, and they're a mix of um, traditional drainage and, as well as green infrastructure projects uh, that are of the type that we need to do more of and some of them are enormous like the Mirabu water garden in Gentilly is like 13 million gallons I mean it's huge this is where they're turning the uh, St. Joseph's convent into like a water garden that Holds. Yeah, basically a big public park, but with an enormous uh, water storage uh, built into it. And how does that work? Like, so, like water storage is like it'll be a mix of surface water and underground storage, as well as like the idea with any kind of green infrastructure is you want you want to trap the water and hold it, but you don't really want to hold it longer than about forty eight hours, because if you hold it longer than that, then you get mosquitoes. <laughs> so all of all, almost all green infrastructure is designed uh, in New Orleans, at least, to for like that slow percolation back into the soil, and that keeps the it keeps the soil hydrated, it keeps your groundwater stable, and it prevents mosquitoes. So the the Mirabu property is really cool, and it has amazing potential for stormwater management because, in in part, it is on top of like a vein of really sandy soil underneath, and sand. Um, as you know, if you've ever been to the beach, sand, like you pour water over sand, it absorbs it right away. Mm-hmm. If you pour water on top of clay, which is what most of our other soils are, clay absorbs far less than sand. So if you can hit, if you can take a green infrastructure feature where you're getting a ton of water into a sandy pocket, then it just, it has tremendous a, a ability to convey that water away from your site in a way that a clay soil area would not. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. But can you uh, put a stolen car into one of these? <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't. Well, what the fuck? <laughs> Luckily, but the bayou is not going anywhere. Dang. Eventually, you have to pump the water out. So it's it's part of a system. No, you of- don't. Like, not if you. Um, I mean, part of the problem is like we've we've paved over so many places that we've, um, you know, we've we've built more of a bowl than we need to, right? Okay. Um, 
So the idea behind major projects like Mirabu is that you actually relieve stress on the pumps and you don't need to convey all of that water into a traditional concrete drainage system because instead you can get it back into the groundwater. Okay, but not all of it. Not all of it, yeah, no. So I mean, we're never going to not need the pumps. That's what I was getting at. Yes. Like, I mean, from what I understand, like it still needs to be, some of it needs to be pumped. But the, yeah. the advantage is that, you know, you don't have to immediately pump it all out at like a superhuman capacity that right. we don't have now. And the fact is that we're never going to be able to build a system that can handle nine inches of rain in three hours or mm-hmm. whatever it was. Like we, if we tried to design our pumping system to do that, we would need to um, triple it in size. So like we can't, we can't do it. Right. That would cost, I mean, it, we just can't do it. And so it's, and that's not a failure of political imagination. Like I'm not, I think I've proven myself as somebody who doesn't think that, like, everything needs to meet a a cost-benefit analysis or whatever. You know, like, there's... I'm not saying that because I think, like, I'm too timid to ask for it. I'm saying that we don't need it because we can do these other kinds of interventions and also recognizing that, like, we're going to get some water in the streets because it's where we are. It doesn't mean that we have to, like, have our cars flooding three times a summer. Of course not. But we overpave, and we don't manage our water in any kind of integrated way. Like, we can do a lot better and have it be a lot more cost-effective than trying to get Congress to fund a new SELA project every time we have a storm like yeah. this. Because they're not going to. And also, that one didn't really offer us a whole ton of benefits. But at the same time, like, in order to get even these new concepts, like, up and running and really to make the whole... Because would you... you have what you're talking about is is reimagining the entire city's system. Like there is, yeah. there's a lot of money anyway. I mean, you still are going to need. There is, but the the good part is that you can do it in a more distributed way. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot that individual people can do on their own properties. You know, there can you don't have to necessarily have a huge streets project if everyone on your block changes their front lawn to right. have more of this stuff involved. Right, you know, you can you can decentralize a lot of this stuff and to tremendous benefit. I, is, I feel like we're House Targaryen, House Lannister, and House Stark discussing what's going on in Westeros when the White Walkers, which is global warming, they're on their way down and everything's just going to kind of they're they're going to come and take over all of Westeros anyway. So. Well, th- there's a couple of things about that. One is Cedric Grant. This week said, "Yeah, hey, it's it's climate change. Y'all deal with it." That was one of the first I mean, things he said. Co- Winter's coming, but which is kind of ridiculous. Like, uh, if we're going to live here under the new circumstances, like expecting uh, a huge rainfall like every year, well, we have to prepare for it and we have to learn to deal with it. And, and learning to deal with it is not like, oh, the water's coming in my house every year. No, it's like, well, how how do we arrange our drainage system in a more like a better way. Yeah, again, it still like, sounds like you know those scenes where you see them all talking about who's going to win the war and stuff. Well, I and we're like, yeah, whatever. The fucking I think not the White Walkers really. are coming. I think I think actually this you know the these 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 new concepts are ways to adjust to the new reality. I mean, it's like uh, when the Cat Five storm comes and the eighteen foot storm surge well, comes no. right up to the levees. No, that's different. They're going to handle that? No. Well, and what we're, talking <laughs> okay. about, what we're talking about is the interior system. Right. So this is another misperception that people had. The pumps that we re- that the Army Corps built at the end of the outfall canals, those are not part of what we're talking about here. Right. We're not talking about storm surge. We're not talking about gates. We're not even really talking about outfall canals, except as a way of like getting this stuff that we pumped out. And a lot of times they lower the level in the canals... Uh, before a big storm that they know is coming. Saturday came up too quick. They lowered what they could, but like they didn't have a lot of time to lower to make room for that water that they were going to pump up into the canals. Because remember, the pumping stations are at the lowest part, so they have to lift all that water up, and then like they have to lift it up higher to get it over the ridge, and then it flows from the ridge down towards the lake, um, just by like gravity flow. So like it's actually fucking amazing that they can do this. Like when you think about it, it's really no. It's 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 impressive. Like the the pumping system as it is now is incredibly impressive. Like it's just we don't we aren't 
keeping it up, and we have right. It's even more impressive when it's not on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and run by dudes in a machine shop, <laughs> dwarves, you know, in there, prank, and like king, king. Is that what it? Yeah, I bet you that's what it sounds like. It does just, exactly like that. Like <laughs> doing <laughs> welding and shit going on. Anyway, yeah. so there's a certain. All right, can we like, talk like about something? The machinist else? and yeah. the machine shop are bred. You know, <laughs> they all have to be in the same family and stuff like that. It's a, they have to learn how to work the machine shop from a young age, or else you'll never be up to speed. You know. Just, are you sure this isn't just a dream you had? It might be. I've been taking melatonin a lately. Lucid dream. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, um, we are 12 minutes over schedule. Yeah, so... We, we haven't should... talked about the Saints yet, but what's there to talk about? Did you watch that game last, yesterday? No! <laughs> My phone said, hey, bro, there's a Saints game on. I'm like, holy shit, there's a Saints game on. <laughs> I, am, I am so fucking unaware of... Like, when the Hall of Fame game came on, I was at Juan's Flying Burrito, and I looked up, and I was like, there are professional football teams playing on that television right there, and it is not NFL Network. Holy oh. shit, yeah, football is here. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's okay. The, I I kind of felt like this would be, like, the least watched Saints preseason opener, um, you know, in a while, because, for one thing, everybody's dealing with this flood stuff, you know. Right. Um, and but, uh, no, just Mid-City. Yeah, and okay, so do. it wasn't watched. Nobody in Mid-City was source. watching. Um, Are you in Section 617 this year, Allie? No. Damn. This was going to be the greatest 617, 617 I, season uh, of all time. I can't. The Dirty uh, Boys are going to be there. I'm very happy for y'all. No, I'm saying we're going to be there, and we would like for you to be there. The fuck? Um, what? what happened? I can't. I can't get it up for the NFL anymore. Oh shit! Well, you know, you know what happened last night was the Saints lost their tenth consecutive the NCAA season game, and the reason they lost more. was because Deshaun Kaiser threw like two like fifty yard touchdowns. Really? Yes, in the fourth quarter. Holy shit! Yeah, it, one of them like burned the shit out of uh, Eric Harris, and the other one burned the shit out of Damian Swan, who's the Georgia boy. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Deshaun. So I'm you so might, happy for him. I thought you would be. I hope he does well. How did um, also, Brandon Man- Coleman do? Manti Teo had a really you know impressive start. Okay. Was, he started at the Mike linebacker and he played pretty well. And right. in the first quarter, the Saints defense looked like they were playing you know respectably. They've constantly done against that. Cleveland, so you know. Yeah, they're um, they're. It's not really a whole lot. Throw that there. girl that always keeps you thinking that there's a chance. You know. The first preseason, you believe game, in her, and then she just lets you down. First preseason game is so stupid, though. Like you, you get. If you watch it and you listen to the fans on Twitter, like they all like have these weird ass conclusions about the, how the whole season's going to go because they've been, of it. Yeah, they've been waiting for fucking <laughs> through the frozen tundra of baseball and basketball to yeah. get to this. So. None of it matters. It's like, uh, I mean, I no, guess, it doesn't. I, I, I guess it was, it was, it looked like the first team defense was okay. They're going to suck. I think that the defensive backs are not anywhere near as good as people think they are. And I also think that uh, they uh, – oh, Ted Ginn is going to drop like 50 passes this year, and that will be a, like a running joke all season. But other um, than that, I really last shouldn't, season shouldn't have so many damn Ohio State guys. <laughs> right, so now we have Ted Ginn. So, yeah. Haven't we had him for a while? No, he's he's new. He's new oh. with us. It's uh, it's the last uh, dance for Breeze and Peyton, basically. This could year. be. It could be. It seems to be, because they're not going to do shit. I mean, there, there's a reason to think they're going to do shit. <laughs> Maybe. What Maybe is it? Brings a turtle. Maybe is like okay. I, I have. What a, is the reason that they're going to do? What it might be the reason they're going to. I have do a whole well, theory. They're all going to, um, you know, keep getting those. Keep hitting those heads. Just keep knocking those That's heads. That's right. Yeah. Just all fall along. Lay some concussions on people. In fact, uh, the, there was a Browns player got concussed on the second play of the game. Great. Was like, oh, two plays, one concussion. See, yeah. but it's good that you hate the NFL because it's not going to be around much longer. Well, They're I mean, get this sued is out of this is why I hate Oblivion. the NFL because they. I don't. Well, I don't know. Hate. I've fallen out of love with the NFL because. The head injuries because the public 
money for private stadiums because the like the coercive nature of it all like it's just it just and then it's on top of that it just feels extremely phony like the constant like flag waving and military tributes and like I don't know, man. The more, the longer, like the older I get, the more I'm like, I can't, I can't even. Deal Stupid with this little stuff boat anymore. race where you got to pick which boat wins. That's the good bucket. part. I, <laughs> the Copeland's boat race <laughs> rules. And you didn't but, even get into the uh, the the uh, the yearly pink washing. Oh right? yeah. That's, so, but the NFL's corporate culture is terrible, it's and awful. it's right. Um, but I've I've probably told you before my whole like you know Marxist theory of like we like these are they're all of these teams are like profiting off of our like not only our tax dollars like our actual money that we've spent on public facilities and such but like our own souls and hearts and like like the symbols of our what we think of as our you know cities and yeah like our fandom like our own faith there's and a lot of dead labor in the this is right yeah. there's there's a lot of like we produce that, right? Embedded. That's that's yeah. we we produce those things, and it belongs to us, and it doesn't belong to Tom Benson. It doesn't belong to the people. Um, oh yeah, he does get like this every now and then. So it's always sweet when he does. Yeah, I I don't look at it as like I mean I I, I think your your way of looking at it is exactly right, but like I have this also kind of like yeah, but one day we're gonna revolt and we'll just like nationalize the whole thing. I'm the galaxy brain, you're the cosmic brain. That's right. That's where we are right now with that. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Tom Benson got another statue by the way this uh this yeah. week. They they the They got thing. his paunch and everything. Yeah, he's got so many How many bronze toms are there now? There's like um, too many. <laughs> I think there's 3. There's the one in front of the Superdome, there's the one in Canton. And then there's one that they just kind of fly over the United States at all times, like in a 747, <laughs> to make sure that... Is the, that Bronze Tom the, Zero? The chain, yeah, the chain is never broken. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, wait. wait the bronze wait. Toms can never... There's, there's also Mini Bronze Tom. Have you seen Mini Bronze Tom? No. So oh, is that the one that he was holding at the statue, at the original Bronze Tom So there was, like, photos of... Yes. Photographic evidence of the third bronze tom. There's a, there's a little there's a miniature version of yes. the of the Champion Square bronze tom Ooh. that there's a, one of my favorite photographs is like at the dedication there's this picture of Tom and Rita on his left and Gail on his right. Oh. And Bobby Jindal in the back of and uh, some other of your favorites and Tom is sitting in his wheelchair and he's holding mini bronze Tom and he's looking directly at it and they're like looking at each other and they're contemplating one another why are you always like <laughs> like you do, you do these little fantasy like you're, you're <laughs> it reminds me of he's how, always trying to get into the head of Tom Benson do you guys, yeah. do you guys know the um, the American Girl dolls they're kind of yeah. famous so at one point you could get an American Girl doll but you could also get a mini American Girl doll for your American Girl doll oh, <laughs> and you could also dress like your American Girl doll so you could be fractals are beginning yes to exactly <laughs> like, the closer and, you look and at I love it, that they tried to recreate that experience for bronze to- or for Tom Benson Tom with his and, own statue yeah and he could hang out under his statue uh, with himself and the little one yeah, all together it's yeah. perfect it's like uh, a Matryoshka doll of capitalism. What I think we should do is we need to get a hold of the little one. I mean, maybe there's like lots of copies of these. It could be er- everywhere, and we need to go to all of the Confederate monument sites and like do uh, the little traveling gnome photograph and make our own posters of bronze. Where's Tom. bronze Tom at right now? Yeah, like at the empty statues. At, yeah, like on top of where Robert E. Lee was. There's oh. bronze Tom. Okay. Like on top of where Jefferson Davis was, well, there's there's Bronze Tom with this. That I think we need to do that. That's a project for the future. Huh. Also, I've I've got this theory that uh, you know he's first of all he's got the Hall of Fame, the Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium or whatever it is. Yeah. Tom Benson Field at Hall of Fame Stadium. Also at Yulman Stadium in uh, on Tulane's campus, uh, it is officially it's Tom Benson Field at Yulman Stadium. And I just I think that someday we're gonna dig underneath these stadiums and there's gonna be like a terracotta army of bronze toms down there. <laughs> That's does, just wait, does it <laughs> do they forget to fund like Brother Martin Stadium? Right. Well they, they don't have a stadium, one? they play at Tag Gormley. They do? Oh yeah. 
right. Just like every 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 Catholic League team in the city plays it. Well, they've got bagel. some fields behind the high school. I don't know if they had a football thing back no, there. Dude, do you know what is named after Tom Bron- uh, Tom Benson at the uh, at at Brother Martin? A bunch of stuff, like all the religious stuff. No. What? The library. Oh, okay. It's the Tom Benson Library. It's a little big crusader uh, trivia for you there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, um, and he bought a brewery also. He, he oh yeah, owns Dixie. Yeah, I can't wait. He's I, diversifying his bonds. I love how like he's just buying all kinds of shit. He's like, I buy this shit, I buy that shit. No, no, no. He said that he wanted to. Uh, well, how much to buy to convert the pumps to what? Are, what do you call sixty? Sixty cycle power. I'm gonna convert the pumps to sixty cycle power because I'm fucking Tom Benson, y'all. What you need a billion dollars? There's a billion dollars, motherfucker. Yeah, that's kind of good because you know, put a Brad Tom at every pump station. In the Dixie story, they said that he was actively seeking like local brands, like New Orleans, like ain't there no more brands mm-hmm. to bring back. Hugh Biggs, Hugh maybe Biggs. next. But like the pumps would be one, right? Like that's a. Yeah. It doesn't get any nullier than now than Come the on, goddamn Tom. sewerage and waterboard. <laughs> like Tom Benson, Dixie, sewerage and waterboard. They could brew on 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 site. Yeah, man. Shit. Man. That's that's good water use. We you know, convert turn all the water into beer. Eventually everything is gonna be Tom Benson's. It's just Tom Benson's New Orleans. Well he's gonna die. Right. And then Rita's gonna I mean whatever the one. Rita's the daughter, right? No, okay. The granddaughter. Holly. What's his wife's name? Gail. Gail. <laughs> Gail's going to take the money and, and, and go. Well, we should take a break. All right, you ready? We are about half an hour past. All right, so we uh, even we'll take a break and then we'll come back and do... Uh, we all know. have trips to talk about. Again. Yeah, we all have trips to talk about. And we ramble on and on during those. All right, well, it's... Uh, I can't wait till that happens. Okay, bye. bye. It's raining. Yeah, it's recording now. We're back. Uh, Great. Yeah. Hi. Hey. The ghost of Pat, cousin Pat, was just in this room. <laughs> it was just. It was like he was almost here. It wasn't my fault. It was, yeah. It was almost like he was here. It was almost like Southern Rock was playing through these balls. <laughs> I don't think that happens very often. Um. So, Jeff, did you what? go to any restaurants or see any movies or watch any new Netflix series? Do you want me to say no? Or did you go to any public talk? meetings? I did a whole <laughs> bunch of... That. What so did, how did been, you step on stepping out this week? So it's been a long time since we've been here. Yeah, we've probably forgotten some shit we did. One of the things that happened was, uh, you know, Allie and I both had birthdays. Like Another year older. Another year closer to death. Yep. Congratulations. I think that when I try and get through summer in New Orleans, it's like, gotta get through this fucking summer. Gotta get to October. And then October comes, that first cold front comes through. I'm like, ah, one less summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not, there's a no win situation when you're a fatalist fucker. Oh my God. You know, it's It's the saddest shit I've ever heard. I know, I know. This is my life. This is how all the folk art happens. So let me tell you how I, I celebrated my birthday this year. We went to the. 
Mid City Yacht Club and watched uh, Lamar launch his publication. Oh, we were there. Yeah. I was there for that. Yay. So, uh, you know, the the kickoff party for the Bayou Brief. Um, we were there the for The Pelican that. Brief. The one-legged pelican? The one-legged pelican. Ladle with a leg. Yeah. Uh, so we were there the for hanger, that. The Clothes Hanger Journal. Clothes what? Hanger Herald, we'll call it. That sounds, it's got a <laughs> little alliteration at the end. And then since... My pelican's better. Uh, if you talked to Lamar, it was part of his listening tour. Yeah. He went on listening no, to it was a Southeast. listening tour of Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they sang "Happy Birthday." Normally, to me something in a politician room, does. So that was kind of cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so we just saw a lot of people there. That was kind of nice. And then uh, after that, you and I. Shark pull. So me and Lance and, and Mankles, uh you know, got out of there and went downtown to investigate the shock pole, which is... Oh, right. On a mission. Long-time listeners, or at least people who listened to the last episode, will remember that the shock pole is an urban legend uh, about the French Quarter. It's an what? urban reality. Myth not busted. Myth, no. Com- whatever the myth busters do when the shit's true. Right. Con- confirmed. confirmed. So Shock pole exists. So we got a tip... From uh, from one of our listeners who said that there is a space near the chart room where there is a payphone, which is very near uh, a support for a balcony where you could put your hand on the payphone housing and your hand on the pole, and there's where the the magic happens. And so we rushed down there to simultaneous. Check that out. No, never mind. <laughs> um, Mankles. <laughs> And maybe you can record this after we leave. Said several times the reason why this phone um, has been did not get grounded correctly. I think it's because because telephone engineers they don't ground it. You know they're not paid to be electricians. They don't ground the wires. They're just phone engineers. So they 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 just hook it up any whatever way. You know. Is that what she was saying? That's what What's she that was voice? saying. Was she that's, saying that's that, in that voice? Yeah. Uh. I don't remember. She's trying to be cute. That's how she talks. <laughs> she keeps in there that voice. A little bit. I don't know what it is. It's... So, uh, okay. just complaining about voices. I know. But anyway, so <laughs> what, did we, what did we discover there when we got there was that the, uh, the, the housing for the payphone was already gone. Like, you know, because they're ripping these out all yeah, across America. Yeah, victim of and our modern age. So all we could less crime though. All we saw there was uh, a decapitated stump of remnant of shock pole. Was what was at one time the the phone, and uh, sticking out of the top of it were like a couple of like loose wires. And uh, you know, one of us thought, well, okay, so I guess we'll just like fuss around with them and see what what happens. It's <laughs> like nice. Bill Belichick fussed around with his. Uh with the car radio, with his car radio yeah. and the all Bill Belichick off-season simulator. Right. So I, I won't say which one of us did this, but you know the stupid one uh, thought, well, okay, well, if we just kind of push the wires together, uh, maybe maybe we'll maybe something will happen here. And yeah, uh, at some point, like there was like a blue flash. Oh yeah, and, it was a blue, definitely blue. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe electricians can tell us what that blue colored. Heat flame is, but and a pretty loud pop too. Yeah, it was, it was like uh, it exploded, and it was uh, the best moment of the night. <laughs> I wonder how that that stuff all fared in the rain. Well, we Over think that we may have inadvertently contributed to the final demise. Yeah, we of couldn't the shock pole. We couldn't reproduce the experiment because I think we what had happened was it got so hot near the end. You killed the. We shock melted pole. the 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 casing that went over the wire. Oh wow! And it sealed it when it then suddenly that's a know, theory dried yeah. up. Well, well, we couldn't we couldn't make it happen again. No, we couldn't. No matter how hard we tried. And then well, we went you were only the, working with one hundred percent of the electrical capacity available to you at the time. <laughs> true, <laughs> true. And then so, we went to the chart house. Which is always fun. Yeah, it's always a, that's a good it's a good local quarter bar, good spot. Yeah, so I think that's probably my my best story from the last month. We did, did you guys some other go out to dinner for your birthday? Yeah, we went to uh, DTB, which is a uh, already closed. No, well maybe <laughs> I haven't checked check check Twitter right now. See if they're closed. Um, 
It's relatively new. dying quicker than Game of Thrones characters in <laughs> season seven. It's relatively I liked, new. I liked it back when it was still named DTF. <laughs> Right. It was named that? that? No. Oh, God. <laughs> like, someone was like, oh, you know what that fucking means, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a completely different concept. Uh, no, it means down the bayou. Well, <laughs> yeah. I would imagine a restaurant would be a different, completely different concept than <laughs> a uh, sexually willing... I guess mostly women are generally DTF. You assume that men are always DTF. No, I don't Do think you? anybody assumes anything. <laughs> well, okay. Well, anyway. It just seems weird when you say this dude's DTF. You're like, yeah. Some dudes are just thirsty like that. Hmm. <laughs> I should. I'll get me a DTF button and I'll wear it around. <laughs> yeah, yo, Roethlisberger, DTF, bro. Um, so go ahead. It sounds. For, it stands for down to buy you. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, it's that's fucked up because it should be DDF down to buy you. <laughs> well, okay. Who runs this motherfucker? Are they legit? They're they're local people, yeah. They're uh, are they local? They're from New Orleans. Yeah, you think DDB. They're not, they're not fucking from the Bayou. Right. Well, don't hold me to this, but I, my my memory of reading about it is that they're local, like to New Orleans area. So maybe doesn't count. Uh, although I think one of them has family from like you know down like Homer or something like that. Okay, that, that counts. That's the best I can do. That's not sort of down looking the Bayou. At it, it gets me. more down to Bayou than that. No. But all right. But it, it was it wasn't. I'm bad. suddenly an expert on it. Um, I remember they had a, uh, a a gumbo that I liked. It was a, it was just it was crab meat and greens, which is you don't see very often as Mm-mm. a combination. But it was it was good. And uh, I think I had a redfish that I liked. Uh, Chris had some kind of like uh, fried catfish arrangement. <laughs> and the only complaint that I, oh wow that the was only, interesting. The only thing I can say about it that is is a little concerning is that it's like you know. Local cuisine, but elevated in the way. Oh yeah, yeah, that always sucks. And and what that means <laughs> is that, like, you're spending like twenty dollars for like a bowl of catfish. How much was know? the catfish? Twenty bucks? It was, it was something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was too much. But like, again, they're trying to make it a dining experience, so you have to kind of decide how you feel about that. It was yeah, I like it. You just can't pay too much for it. You yeah, know? I, I thought it was good, so I'm not gonna. Where like, is it at? It's on Oak Street. I don't know the cross street, but there's a lot of little restaurants like that around here now that are um, that that kind of name themselves or pattern themselves about after places outside of town. It's yeah, like, it's like the opposite of like how every, everyone's fleeing the suburbs, but like cuisine is like going out into the outskirts. Yeah, it's the it's the Cochon phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that Sakale restaurant, you know, and. There's another one and downtown. What was, there was one called Morapa that went out of business. Yep. And there was a, there's got to be a Man Jack, huh? There's there should be if there is a there's there's a new one there's downtown porn. that I can't remember. Oh, the name see, of. yeah, yeah. We get it. No, there's not a Slidell yet. <laughs> there's not a Harvey. We'll get there. No, the ones named <laughs> there's not a Bridge City. The no, the ones named after people are generally just like nobody wants to eat at the restaurant called Kenner, you know? Or Wagaman. Duncan Kenner. <laughs> <laughs> Avondale, <laughs> St. Rose, Golden Meadow, there's almonds. Uh, that I think that, that sounds pretty good. That sounds like uh, a French place. Huh? Yeah, that might be a thing. Grand Isle. The- Grand Isle is a restaurant called that. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So. yeah, and it really confuses your GPS if you're trying to drive to Grand Isle, the place. <laughs> no, you're pulling You're going wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Think of how many tourists got fucked up by that. Uh, that's all you did in the last month? No, I did more things, but I don't want to take up all the time. So. Oh, okay. Well, you didn't mind taking up the time reading. I'd rather. I'd rather give my. Said time, I would cede my time to Cedric Grant. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> so nice. I like your style, dude. So uh, who wants to go next? One of you guys. Uh, I'll go next. All right. Uh, I went to Houston for their white their version of White Linen Night. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I didn't know that it was something that happened outside of New Orleans, um, but it does. I don't know how far it goes. I don't know if Mobile has it, but um, if it does go, I think we started it first. So if Mobile does try and steal that, like Mardi Gras, Mm -hmm. we started it first. Okay. Uh, We went there. uh, Apparently, all the art happens in a different part of the city, uh, the lower heights or the higher heights. But anyways, the part of the city where it happens in is the heights. And you're not allowed to drink down there. 
and people walk around with like, because you know they got them laws in Texas. Like I could have bought a gun at Bucky's, but I could not have <laughs> bought a fucking twelve pack of Lone Star. No, you could. Uh, yeah, like own the school year. Yeah, it's just one of them fucked up. You could have gotten the Lone Stars things. tattooed on you in the Bucky's. Anything could have happened, but I was not walking out of there with that ice cold, ice cold fucking. And you'd already put your dirty hands all over it. You know how dirty my hands are. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, what happens is, is that the people go down there, they act kind of cultured and shit, and then mostly they just start going back up into the other parts of the Heights where there's bars and just massive parking lot parties uh-huh. everywhere. Like the streets, like people, they close the streets off and shit like that. And uh, me and Jeremy, were uh, there's a restaurant group in New Orleans that buys our art all the time. And one of their locations is there, so we brought all our art there, and we're showing it out there. Basically, people go there to just get fucked up. Many of the people we talked to blatantly stated they didn't get out much. They looked like they didn't get out much. There was a lot of white denim. White mm. denim. It might actually. They need. To, they might need to change the, their name to White Denim Night. Because <laughs> it, it, it was they were it was everywhere, right? Mostly the ladies, um, all kinds of hairstyles that I just didn't know existed. You know, weird little moose things. Men are wearing lots of product in their hair outside of New Orleans. Um, we didn't sell much, and then we came home. We did not get pulled over in Jeff Davis Parish. So that was oh, good. good. Yeah, we, even though we were prime, driving a U-Haul and everything. Um, but you didn't sell a whole lot. At, we didn't at sell a whole white, lot. No white denim. Most night. of the people we didn't sell. Oh, we sold uh, a piece to Lee Checkman, and we saw Lee and Dan. Oh, good. Oh, nice. Yeah, they were good. Going, going strong. Um, good people. Funny, witty, and so then we came back. And then what the fuck else did I say? I, I did. You went on a writers' retreat. Ah, thank you, Jeff. I went up to the Crosby Schoolhouse, owned by Karen Gadbois. And I had, like, because, you know, I have all these little fiction stories that I've been trying to write. But I've had them half-written for fucking years. I know what that feels like. Well, So, you write fiction? No. Oh. I know what it feels like to have half-written things. Essays? Yeah, well, things. Saints Post. Mm -hmm. Saints Post. Um... So I went up there and I just figured I would go up there alone. I would have nothing to do but write. And it would be a very peaceful setting in which to do so. And it yeah. fucking was. I came up there. I got one story finished the first night I showed up. That's good. That was great. What? The power went out because a tree fell on a line. And it took 12 hours energy. It was fucking <laughs> up up there. Just the same. I was following the little outage map. <laughs> on my phone and shit didn't have any power in Crosby, Mississippi. It was yeah. It was it was like wow. I gotta find. I got my my computer was powered up, so I was like I could charge my phone up off my computer. If my computer dies, I can still do this. Sure. I was trying to figure out how to like I how to like create fire for coffee and shit like that. It was it got a little fucking survivor there uh-huh. for a little while, and then right when I was about to get like pissed off about it, the power came back on. Finished another short story that night. Finished the final one on Wednesday. Now, when I say finished, I did not finish them completely. I, I, I got them. I got the narrative to the end of the story. Okay. And finished it, like it the brain dump. Yeah, I, I created the framework, and now yeah. I got to go back, pretty them all up, and and then do the fine, tiny little details, the real fun parts, right? And then I had about three hours left. Uh, a friend was coming to stay with me. She was on her way, and I was like, well, let me just see if I can start something here. Um, then started Stream of Consciousness, doing some stuff. Wrote about fifteen to 1,800 words on a great little story about a girl, a little girl who was born, and she's made of balloons. And her parents had to figure out how to deal with her. Because every time she walks into something, a balloon pops. And then she's just, like, sent into this, like, traumatic fucking episode. And she has to deal with it. And slowly but surely, her parents are like, you know, balloons are going to pop sometimes. You're going to have to deal with it. And then the balloons are helium balloons. So she also has to, like, wear these, like, lead shoes. 
or else she'll float away. And she have a high pitched voice. Uh, no, I can I can write that in there if you want. I got no, about halfway I've through that. There's a pivot in the story that happens. She gets basically raised, and then there's a pivot in the story. Okay. And I ended it right at that pivot. Yeah. So you finished. Well, and you that finished. one's done pretty much. I like I there. There's not a real framework I needed to do for that because there's not a lot of change of scenery in that one. So, um, what is it about being out there that helps you? Because you got nothing else to do. First of all, you're there on a mission. You're like, you're, I'm going to do these things. Mm-hmm. You're not like, I could do this with my day. I could do that with my day. I could let me do... What's what's the best use of my time? Which, you know... I got any number of things going. Um, so n- there I'm like, I'm, I'm here for 72 hours. It's the only thing I have to do. There's nobody around to distract you. And it's a very... It's an old schoolhouse. So think right. of all the... I mean, I don't really believe in energies and stuff like that. But your mind creates a atmosphere and a... A narrative in and of itself to think. Oh, think of all the learning that's been that's done in this school. Think of all the things. Think of all the stories, all the imagination that's happened in this place. There's a grand piano in one of the rooms. There's Karen does all her sewing in one of the rooms. There are two other. There are two quilters in the rooms. There's this long hallway that you can play music in. There's a swing in the middle of the hallway. There's all this old wood. There's this like table that. Um, that uh, that farm hands used to like when they would come in from the farm they would all sit around this really long table all solid pieces of wood fucking 18 to 20 feet long that you just sit at and you type and shit so it creates there, there's a it's a it's a very nice it's a creative atmosphere it's inducive to were there other stuff. other people there at the time that you were there no or? and yeah. that helped okay. you know so you're not you don't feel as though, oh, well, do they want to come in and have lunch? Blah, blah, blah. And you're not kind of pulled away by that. Okay. It's just you and, you know, writing's fucking hard because it's one of those one things that you you got to do from nothing. You know, right. it's like with painting, yeah, whatever, you got this red paint. And that red paint is brilliant and beautiful. And you have that to lean on, sort of. With writing, it's just fucking nothing. You got to make something from nothing. You know, so it's challenging. But it worked out. I mean, the stories aren't done. I'm not super happy with them. And now I don't have to do the like heavy lifting. Like the, the hard part of it is kind yeah. of like making it all all the ideas and stuff coming out. Getting and, her but, or him, getting them through their little story where yeah. they go through their things, moving them from one environment to the other, and doing that in a way that the reader doesn't get, wait, how did they do that? Why did, wait, 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 we're here now? You know, just doing that. She walked up the stairs and turned and looked at the corner and saw him there on the bed with the other woman. You know, that's not fun to write. <laughs> but you gotta write it so the reader fucking knows that this shit is happening. You know, it's nuts, like the drywall of nuts the fucking nuts. story. Right. You know? So, <laughs> got all that done. Maybe I'll go back up there and and took a lot of great Instagram pictures too. I saw some of those. They yeah. were fun as fuck, and that was very creative. You know, mm-hmm. and inspiring. And then you can just. Then you can, when you really just feel as though you need to fucking get away from the fucking screen, you just go out into the hallway, you put your little fucking cordless speaker on, you play your Beyonce, and you fucking dance for like fucking 10 minutes and shit. Well, get that's your blood different. pressure up, swing, mm-hmm. look at the dead animals, go back inside, type some more. Did that. And then I'm about to do that again, but we'll talk about it the next Hunger Down guys. So that's your, that's your second one. That's the. Uh yeah, so, went right. to the Crosby Schoolhouse. Okay. There's an exit call that says Liverpool Kentwood, and I'm like, Britney Spears is from one of those. The Beatles are from the other. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so much shit you think about on the road. So much energy out there. Yeah, so All much right. talent. <laughs> yeah, what you did, Alan? I've been, I've been gone, as I mentioned. Um, we went on a road trip um, up to Michigan, and since it takes like we drove, we drove Fuck. so. We camped on the way up, which was a fun adventure. Wait, you camped on the way up? Like, uh-huh. Like, so where did you stop to camp? So we stopped in Mississippi the first night um, in the Tom Bigby National Forest, and then we um, and then we took the Natchez Trace Parkway, up, Ooh. which is my favorite. Hell yeah! Favorite road. Uh, we took Best that. Best road ever. 
Yeah, I totally agree. It's a two-lane road. It's managed by the National Park Service, so it's, like, a little bit lower speed limit. But okay. uh, there's, like, historical markers and, like, beautiful little side hikes and stuff all along it. Lots of overhang, tree overhangs and stuff. Yeah, beautiful rural landscape. Um, it, there's no billboards. There's no semi-trucks. There's, like, nothing. It's wonderful. Um, Did you get all the way to Nashville on that? Uh-huh. So you that little bridge at the end, the yeah. little dessert. Oh, man, there's a beautiful bridge at the end. Yeah, so we took that all the way to Nashville. We ate in Nashville, and then... Did you eat at the little place at the end of it, the little breakfast spot? Mm-hmm. I forgot the name of it. No, we did eat at a breakfast spot, though, but it was, um, it was like, in Nashville. Okay. Um, and then we went, we went up... Uh, How was Nashville? We were only there for lunch. Okay. Because then we went to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. I was there too! Well, and we tried to stay overnight there. Uh, we, we were planning on staying over the night there, but the heat index was 110, so we were like, no. <laughs> like in the caves? No, because oh. you can't sleep in the caves. You never know what they got offering. And all the <laughs> Airbnb sleep in the, in the caves. caves. And all the. Uh, well, the tours were sold out for the day, so we couldn't even go in the cave. We're gonna have to do another trip oh, where, wow. we, where we go in the cave. <laughs> yeah, um, but we but we went through the visitor center. That's where we saw that. Um, well, that's where I saw that book in the gift shop about the sinkholes, sinkholes. that I texted to. <laughs> um, sinkholes by Sandra Friend. <laughs> I, I can't. Yeah, it was great. I should have bought it. Maybe I don't need to read it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it was like 110 degrees outside, and so. Fuck. Not only did tent camping sound uh, miserable, it also sounded kind of dangerous in that kind of heat. So um, we got a hotel room in Louisville no. that night. And then the next day we drove through and stopped in Columbus, Indiana, which is a small town uh, between Louisville and Indianapolis. And it's the headquarters of Cummins Engine, uh, which is you know, a huge, huge multinational corporation. And the founders of that company were really into, uh, like, modern architecture. So this town of, like, 40, 44,000 people or something is filled with, like, amazing modern architecture. It is really, it's, it was really cool. We, so we walked Hell around yeah. and looked at architecture for, like, an hour. It was great. Did uh, you camp there? No, we camped up near South Bend. So the other stop we made that day, that was a shorter day. A um, serial camping trip. Was Notre Dame. And so I got to walk around campus again and wow. get lost like 50 yards from my dorm because I didn't recognize all the new buildings. <laughs> all sorts of stuff. Uh, it was, it's changed so much. It was terrifying. <laughs> uh, but it, we walked around there for a while and then uh, we camped at a state park uh, right near there. That it turns out I also camped at when I was a kid because I was having extreme deja vu and then Hell I was like, yeah. "Wait, yeah, I remember coming here when I was a kid." So that was that was funny. Uh, but that by the time we got up in Indiana, the weather was really nice and um, there were like lightning bugs flying around in the woods right next to our campsite, and we, you know, we made steak and like you know it was really it was great. Uh, and then we finished the drive up to Michigan the next day and we were up there for like a week and I was working remotely as much as I could, but Pat was like kayaking and swimming in the lake every day. And, um, all my cousin, like a bunch of my cousins and my cousin's kids were up there too. So it was like 12 of us up at the lake. Uh, so it was really like good family time and really nice to be up there. The weather was awesome. The lake was beautiful. The food was good. I mean, like, my birthday was up there, so I was up there for my birthday, and we had fondue. That was fun. Fondue for your birthday. Like dessert fondue. Okay. Yeah. So the chocolate. Nice Any cheese. kind is good. Not the cheese part. It's always fun to eat fondue. I think so, too. <laughs> Hell yeah, it's a party. <laughs> yeah, you know, you cut up a pound cake, and you get some dried apricots, and you melt that chocolate in there, and you go to town. Or well, any kind, really. Yeah. I'll do the cheese or the oil kind. It's all good. Oh, I like the cheese kind, too, but... Hell yeah. I mean, but we were talking, like, dessert. Anyway, uh, it was good. It's a communal thing. Uh, and then I was in Chicago for a few days. And then I was in Chicago not working because I was uh, at the DSA National Convention as a delegate. So the Democratic Socialists of America... National Convention was in Chicago last weekend. Yeah, so you were a big wheel there. You were like... Uh, I was one of 700 elected delegates to the convention. Yeah, so Jesus. We did three days of eating cold sandwiches and parliamentary debate according to Robert's Rules of Order. It was 
And we stayed in very <laughs> austere dorm rooms. <laughs> was, <laughs> this is exactly how I would expect. I, you know, I went into this with a cynical sound like, well, socialism, oh, convention, blah, blah, blah. Oh. Austere dorm rooms and cold sandwiches. It's exactly what I expect out of that sort of thing. Good job, y'all. Yep. Yeah, no... Nobody wants to be flashy. At no flash. Yeah. No flash at all. No table skirts. No table skirts. No table cloths. It was... It was so, put the banquet tables in there and just leave it. Like, I, I will say, after eating all those fucking sandwiches, by the time I got to eat a hot meal, I, like, nearly cried. I was so excited about hot food. This is like, uh... <laughs> Being trapped in a Jimmy John's for oh, Jesus. I would expect like borscht and you know stuff like that. You know, like, <laughs> that would have been delicious. Like, like, yeah, it would like nice. bread with just soup brushed onto it, you know, and just for flavor. <laughs> so, what would you say was like, you know, I don't know what what was the most inspiring thing about it? I guess. Oh, like, the convention was. It was among the most. Uh, it was by far the biggest democratic thing that I've ever done in my life. Like it was. The biggest number of people making collective decisions according to a, an agreed upon process and people okay. that had been elected by their own delegates and everything you know it was participatory it was it was really cool to be part of something that big I've never been a part of anything like that before um, I also kind of had a realization while I was there you know I had gone into it thinking uh, like oh you know I'm pretty new at this I'm just gonna go to the convention I'm gonna kind of learn and like hang back a little bit, you know, and no, I ended up they have they had me like facilitate three workshops and I spoke from the floor about one of the resolutions that was being voted on and, and it turns out I'm actually pretty good at this, so that was that was pretty cool to um gain that type of confidence, I guess. Uh it was so inspiring to meet everybody from all across the country and hear about what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um met so many amazing people. And uh, to really feel like we're b- building a big project. You know, there were also some folks from left parties around the world, from Portugal and the UK and Brazil, and um, and they spoke and they told us like we're all watching you and we're really proud of what you've done and what you're going to do next. And yeah. So that was a really great feeling. So so this made a big splash, you know, nationally and just I hope in so. The, in the, in the, I mean, it was a big deal. In the national media, uh, there's 25,000 or so now yep. uh, dues-paying members of DSA across the country. It's a huge explosion in the last year. Mm-hmm. So it's a big political story. Yeah. Um, is there something, like, A, I guess, that like you feel like the convention, like, kind of accomplished, you know, for everyone? And is there something from it that you are taking back to New Orleans now, kind of like, you know, as kind of ahead of a chapter yeah, I think, um, you know, we did make some big decisions about the future of the organization. Some of them seem subtle when you talk about them to an outside audience, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it, it seems kind of esoteric. You, um, you know, like, we didn't, and some of them were notable for things we did not. Well, we did do some things. We endorsed the BDS movement. That was uh, big. The boycott, divest, sanctions movement against Israel, and, you know, in support of the Palestine uh, liberation movement. Which um, you maybe now outlaws, because... Yeah, since Congress <laughs> wants to criminalize right. supporting that movement. Which I didn't really have a strong opinion either way about it until I found out about that bill. And then I was like, oh, well, hell yeah, I'm going to vote to support this. <laughs> um, and then we also left the Socialist International, which again, like a, the idea of an international group of political parties is so foreign to most of American political culture that it doesn't register like a big deal, but Mm -hmm. I think it is, um, you know, it's it's something notable that we did. Um, There were some substantive differences between Socialist International and what DSA's goals are also, and so... Yeah, a lot of the parties that are, that are, that remain in the SI are um, actually like authoritarian nightmare parties in places like Angola and stuff like that right and so. in france also there's yes so French socialist party yeah yeah but it, again esoteric kind of to a lot of people but like i, I don't on know the left it's important to right discuss it yeah um but some other things i mean we 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 formed an afro-socialist caucus and a people of color caucus um to continue to grow that work we formed a labor commission to be the home for all of our labor activities to support organizing 
Uh, you know, and it, the convention came in the middle of the Nissan vote in Mississippi, uh, which was really disappointing. Um, but I think it got us all thinking about tactics and uh, in a way that, you know, maybe should have happened before they called that vote but um, or filed for the election. But, uh, you know, there was... There is a thing that we're doing here in New Orleans that everyone else was really excited when they heard about, and it's we're doing a couple events coming up uh, to replace people's brake lights for free. So right. it's called Give Me a Brake Light. And uh, we're doing one on August 26th at uh, Orleans and Broad, and then we're doing another one in September. Wait, are you replacing just the bulbs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if people have a... Um, if you have a, a bad... You have a bad brake light bulb. Yeah. You can go and someone, and if you don't know what to do with it, or you don't, you know, if you can't, or if you can't afford to get it fixed, right? Come and we'll and we'll replace it for you. But if you got like something like like a busted light or something, like yeah, it's a what bit about more. a busted light? Um, I think we'll have some lens tape on hand, to, okay. so we can tape over like if it has a hole in it. But I don't know if we can replace the whole plastic thing. Okay. Dang. But you should come. In, if, I need some more lens tape for mine though. I'll cruise by. I'll bring some bulbs. Well, the idea is that we're trying to prevent people from getting harassed by cops and or from getting pulled into the court system over something as simple and easy to fix as a brake light. So that's the idea behind it. So anything that you uh, see when they come in for the little, to change the bulb, anything that you see, you might could note or say like, hey, maybe let me wiggle these wires or bring some electrical tape and shit like that. Um, If it's frayed, if it's some lady who doesn't know... To deal with it and stuff like that. You know, if if we can do that, I think we'll oh, do our yeah. best. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, I know this dude who sells brake tags on Jackson Square. If you want me to tell him to show <laughs> up at the event, <laughs> he might could help. I mean, let's. Talk I mean, about we won't talk about it. Yeah. All yeah. 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 But yeah, so there's the, no way we're gonna do that. But I told. Well, we'll do that. Now. But I told people at the convention about this idea, and everyone was like, "Holy shit, that's something so." Simple and great, and we should be doing that everywhere. Like yeah. it's a great idea. What I like about it is that I mean, it's like it's hands-on work. Like it's like, like what do we, as as opposed to like you know sitting around in a room and talking about how like this or that thing fits with like the theory that we would like to you know yep. do to organize. It, we're actually going out in the world and affecting a thing and like touching, like it's what what you might call praxis, where theory meets <laughs> action. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the idea behind it. Um, last night we had a fundraiser at Sydney's uh, comedy night that was successful and really, really, really funny. Uh, so that was to raise money for to buy the supplies for the break light events. So, uh, but yeah, the, so we're we're working on stuff like that. Uh, but it was cool to you know kind of workshop that idea with people at the convention and to get their enthusiasm. Oh, great! Yeah. Things are things are rolling. That sounds like a fucking great event. When is it? August twenty sixth. Where? Orleans and Broad. I could show up to that. Okay. Bring some electrical tape. Look at people's stuff. Oh, all you got to do is wiggle this wire right here. Let me tape it up for you. You're good to go, man. Um, follow us on Twitter at New Orleans DSA for more updates. Okay. Um, is that all you got for this week? That's all I got. That's all a right. lot. Yeah, it is a lot, and I think we. Actually, this show is a lot. So no, we got to do the fucking job wire. All right. Oh, great. Let's do it. This is the Hunker Downcast Jive Wire, your fake music calendar for no night in particular. No night. The Jive Wire is sponsored by Ira Way. Ira Ray. What up, Ira? He met Hi, in Ira. the air. Oh, uh, he is about to beat me in our three games of Words with Friends. I've beaten him in one. Okay. He plays a lot. Good to know. Like every time I change, every time I put in a word, it's like three days later I put in another word. He's always there in like twenty minutes. I, I was plays like, a lot. I, I read his wife's uh, baby is due any any day now. Any day any now. Day. He wants to it's be like, on the show. Yeah. Well, but only when Allie's here. Congratulations. Me and Jeff won't do. <laughs> wants that Allie. The full, the full hunker downcast experience. Well, it's, it, well, there's one extra. Then Ira Ray is going to be here. It's going to be the full hunker and then Ira. Okay. I'll split my mic with you, Ira. The Steamboat Queenie hosts Cali Calliope at sunset. Mother and Bills features Gutterpunk Tampon at six. I'm not doing it in the modern way. It's fine. 
It's Frat Larry's host, Napoleon Avenue, featuring Construction Zone. A band, that band broke up, though, huh? You need to take that off. Oh, it's you know what? It's the Tulane Avenue. No, it's Louisiana Avenue featuring Construction Zone now, right? Louisiana Avenue featuring Construction Zone. They got Zone. that new lead singer. Okay. The Least Bank Bar presents the St. Anne Sharks at 7. Pump Station... What the what? Donuts. Pump Station Donuts at the Light- Lamplighter Lounge. At the Lamplighter Lounge at 7. Oh, shit. Um, Vagina Friendly <laughs> presents C. Ray Cray Cray. Still getting that... Man. That Nagin love. Yeah, we're about to be like he's about to be like two mayors ago. At it's nine. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Strollblind Lounge hosts Megalostat at nine. Jeff, come, cuss. What the fuck? Come on, man. What does this say? Hey, give me the paper. Fucking librarians. Uh, it says uh, cosmopolitan bias at the Wall Bar. At, uh, I don't know, what the hell time is it? Nine? nine. Sure. At nine. St. Joe Horns host Anne Rice Krispies at nine. The Pink Elephant host Fred Eye Dick at nine. Okay. Betty's Pub and Grab and Rub and Tug features the Happy Indians. Happy Indians. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Happy Indians at nine. <laughs> <laughs> the Double Take Bar features Driving Miss Baby at 10. <laughs> Driving Miss Baby. Oh, uh, and Bywater Space Place features the Doug McCash Money Billionaires. <laughs> we always love them. <laughs> at 10. Uh, Got one more? Yeah, there's one just in. You want me to read this yeah. one? Yeah. Uh, this is the... Uh, Pop-up gig, y'all. Something called the Seven and Nines are playing at the Bye Bye Breeze Bar at uh, 7 and 9 o'clock. And the Booty Bounce Bar features 7th Ward Sneezy at midnight. The Hunker Downcast Dive Wire is brought to you at the oddest of hours. For an extended listing, check out hunkerdowncast.com slash jive wire, page that does not exist. Get your gig into the jive wire, tweet to at hunkerdowncast or email hunkerdowncast at gmail.com. <laughs> Y'all know what you gotta do. Get out there and support and enjoy, enjoy some live local music. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So I look, we did it. We uh, we uh, we we saw the oncoming flood. We pumped that shit out using um, our um. What, what? We used 100 percent of the audio capacity that was available to us at the time. Right. I think we were a little bit slow in store with this, though. They're just looking at the time here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's I'm shocked. So, uh, but anyway, I, I don't know. And no Allie's way. getting really sleepy. Yeah. It's time for the set. And she's still got to have a nightcap out on the porch, so come on. <laughs> well, let, shit, let's go Let's go do that. And All right, bye, everybody. All right, thanks for listening again, everybody. We'll catch you uh, next time.